Okay. All right. Well, at least we can we can advertise on uh, Facebook that it will be on YouTube if people want to want to check it out later. So welcome everyone to our Thursday webinar. I'm Liz Perry, Crow Canyon's president, and I am really excited, uh, in addition to our speaker, to be joined by two co-moderators today. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to um, uh, Becky Hammonds to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rebecca Hammond. I am a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe here in Colorado, and I am the American Indian Initiatives uh, manager, and I also do a little bit of uh, education. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. We're so glad to have you join us. And a special co third co-moderator today, Emery McDaniel. Emery, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm actually one of Rebecca's interns. I'm one of the two American Indian Initiative interns this year. I'm Wolf Clan from Cherokee Nation, as well as Mascalero Apache. Um, and I am now on my third week, and I'm excited to see the next seven. Wonderful. Thank you, Emery. And welcome, everyone. I'm just going to, before I introduce Dr. Green Bly, I'm just going to do a couple of introduction slides. We always uh, open with our land acknowledgement. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus here sits and where we work and reside. Um, our mission-related work would be impossible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. Uh, we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind, including our work here. We are grateful to all Indigenous people and support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. This ties directly into our mission and our purpose to be here, which is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Please check out our website if you get a chance to look at some of our programs and projects that we have ongoing. And thank you to everyone who's watching for supporting our series. Uh, these are always free webinars, but we accept donations. And so many of you uh, watching today have donated when you registered. And it really helps us keep these going and keep bringing on amazing scholars like Dr. Green Bly. Uh, just a couple of little Zoom notes. Apparently, we uh, Facebook is having a little bit of trouble. Facebook Live is down, um, so um, uh, but we will be. Hopefully, it will pop up at some point. And if not, uh, this recorded webinar will be on uh, our YouTube channel. When you are uh, when you have questions um, during the presentation or after, please use the Q and A function uh, rather than the chat to put your questions in. The chat can get a little busy, and we might lose your questions. Uh, if you need to grab our heads and move us over to the side, there is the black bar uh, adjacent to our heads, and you can move us off if we're taking up too much space. We have some amazing webinars coming up. Uh, our friend Jonathan Till and James William are going to be uh, talking about cataloging archaeological collections at the Edge of the Cedars, really amazing museum. And then after that, some of our own from Crow Canyon, Drs. Josie Chang Order, who is actually on campus teaching students right now, and Elaine Franklin, who used to run our education program, uh, are going to talk about practicing place-based experiential learning in public archaeology. So I hope to see all of you at these next two webinars too. Uh, so without further ado, I'm so excited. We are all very excited to hear from Dr. Melissa Green Bly, who is a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and a professor at the University of Kansas School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Um, really interesting. Uh, Dr. Greenblatt also had a career uh, in the news business for over 20 years as an anchor and reporter covering local news, big and small, uh, in different communities. Um, Dr. Greenblatt has recently presented research at the uh, American uh, Journalism and Historians Association Conference, the joint journalism conference that's held annually in New York City and has recently published in Journalism History. We are so glad to have you here uh, and talking about your important research. Thank you so much, Dr. Green Bly. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be able to be a part of this. Um, 
And like I said, really fantastic to hear about the work that's happening there. Um, so we're going to just spend a little time today looking at reasons why Native nations are so often misrepresented or overlooked um, in the broader journalistic discourse. Um, I'll use some examples uh, culled from more recent stories, uh, talk a little bit about challenges faced by Indigenous media outlets um, and the journalists who work for those as they seek to tell their stories, um, and wrap up with a discussion around resources that are available to help non-Native journalists improve their coverage of Indian country. Um, so I'll do a little bit of scholarly presentation and then um, would love to have some time to answer questions and just have a discussion. Um, there's just a lot of big and important stories happening right now um, that are important for everybody, not just those of us who are citizens of the nations um, involved in those stories. So news media do often fail to offer authentic and accurate representations of Native American communities and individuals. And sometimes that's just a failure to cover issues that are important, that are facing Native nations and individuals. Other times, it's just that tendency to rely on culturally programmed default narratives uh, regarding those nations and individuals. Um, media portrayals of Native Americans are at worst, often based on old stereotypes. Um, at best, they inadvertently perpetuate those stereotypes. And a big part of that is because um, we're not given voice in our own stories. Um, naming and labeling also play an important part in the way that news media often fail to accurately represent Native communities and individuals. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I incorporate it into almost every research article or presentation that I do, is from um, W. Richard West. He's a historian and was founding director of the National Museum of the American Indian. And, and he wrote in the foreword to a book, we hold that it is only when a people assume authority over their stereotypes that they can truly begin to dispel them. And I love that because it speaks to that um, idea of agency um, and having some control, which is a huge part of the gap in the representation we're talking about today. So in order to facilitate that process of allowing Native individuals and communities to assume that authority over their stereotypes um, with that goal of discrediting the same stereotypes, we have to kind of understand how mediated words and images contribute um, to the misinformation um, that is the building block of misrepresentation. So we have misinformation leading to misrepresentation um, and ultimately marginalization. Um, that is a word we still use in our scholarly writings. We do talk a lot about trying to change the stigma around that word because marginalized makes it sound as if there is no pushback. Um, and so for my intents and purposes, um, it is not that at all. It is to say there is a bit of sidelining that goes on because of the structures that we'll be talking about today. One of those is the very nature of the news gathering process um, and the subsequent narrative conventions of storytelling because they necessarily put journalists in a central role. Um, their work shapes broader understandings about the individuals and the groups that are represented in that final news product. Um, newsroom decisions determine who's seen and who's heard. Ultimately, whether images and voices are helpful or hurtful. Um, journalist and media critic Walter Lippmann um, considered the father of the term stereotype. He recognized really early on the power of media messaging as a substitute for firsthand knowledge. He says, inevitably, our opinions cover a bigger space, a longer reach of time, a greater number of things than we can directly observe. They have, therefore, to be pieced together out of what others have reported and what we can imagine. So he talks about pictures in our head that we use as kind of shortcuts to understanding. So that piecing together is aided by this use of stereotypes. And Lippmann simply says, they offer a comfortable way of knowing and ultimately reinforce perceptions 
um, that we need to believe in order to justify our own attitudes and circumstances. So with that understanding, it's really important, um, and I rely on a journalism historian colleague, James Hamilton, he says we have to examine newspapers and other media, not just for what they are, um, but for what they do and how they fit into a larger cultural framework. So in that sense, you know, media are truly artifacts that should be examined in their historical context to understand them in the moment, but also to be interrogated into why is there not improvement in the present day. Um, it really does highlight that necessity of reconsidering our definitions of history and communication um, so that we can critically examine how those narrative formulas and journalistic conventions have factored um, into the stories. And those are stories that we use to define and explain American history, um, specifically as it relates to our understanding of American Indian nations and individuals. Um, those formulas and conventions necessarily fall prey to this idea of um, cultural um, hegemonic narratives, essentially. Um, formulas and conventions um, that essentially elevate voices and actions of one group over another uh, with very clear power dynamics. Um, and that constructed dominant ideology is then used to sell, support, or reinforce a narrative um, justify existing social, political, um, and economic circumstances um, as preordained um, and ineludible. Um, we know that a bit in the term manifest destiny that we'll talk about a little bit more in just a few minutes. Um, history is more than politics or economics. Those factors certainly play an important role in shaping that history, um, but we miss out on important elements of individual and community agency if we rely solely on government documents or financial trends um, and data to understand the past. Um, another historian points out that much of what we think of as factual history is the result of limitations that are imposed by the convention of naming um, and characterizing, which is something we as humans just are driven to do because it makes things easier. Going back to what Lipman said, we like those shortcuts. Um, so if we can accept that meaning can be found in a culture's language and systems of representation, um, we can find necessary freedom to do what James Carey describes as a cultural history of journalism. And that just means a move away from traditional, you know, great man narratives um, beyond just biographies of, you know, founding fathers and, and the great man theory um, to really critically examine, again, that process of reporting and how it positions journalism as a text with power um, to shape social consciousness. Um, that kind of ties into this idea of cultural materialism that came from Raymond Williams. And that simply says, he argued, you know, a study of media is a credible way to understand and evaluate power dynamics historically, um, as well as in the current moment. Um, and I'll be able to show you some good examples here just in a minute that sort of support that. Um, it's the idea that media messaging contributes to that process in really important ways, uh, specifically by molding public opinion for or against certain policies or persons, and also um, by contributing constructions of group identity and consensus. Um, the historical press served as a major instrument of nation building by how it defined American. Um, by default, defining who belonged, um, and more importantly, who did not. Um, another scholar, Benedict Anderson, um, posits that mass media contribute to this notion of nation um, through the creation of imagined communities. So essentially, the media that we're consuming, that we are seeking out or not seeking out, somewhat informs 
the community we think we belong to or we want to belong to, um, or sometimes by defining those communities we do not want to be a part of, that idea of othering um, comes into that. And so media, through that use of stereotypes, contributes to an individual's construction of who they are or are not, um, their sense of identity. Um, it offers a sense of belonging in some cases. And that's often in opposition to a defined construction of an other. Um, so 19th century newspaper representations of American Indians as a problem um, that needed to go away um, or as people who needed to be civilized through assimilation taught newspaper readers that to be American meant supporting policies um, that furthered American progress. And so one of my favorite images, I'm gonna see if my screen will share. Um, let me hit play. One of my favorite images of that is, is uh, this um, painting. Maybe many of you have already um, seen it before. It's literally called American Progress um, by John Gast. Um, and if you just take a moment to examine all of all of the detail contained in this image and what it's saying. Um, the woman in white, for those who, who don't know, is Columbia, who is a representation of um, American progress. Um, and, you know, the details, you see this, she is leading um, light into darkness. And you see, you know, boats and railroads and you know, farming and stagecoaches, covered wagons, you know, moving toward this darkness as she brings light of progress, including, if you note, know, she's holding um, a telegraph wire in her hand. Um, so she's bringing communication to this darkness, right? Um, and then if you notice what is ahead of her, um, we see Native Americans, we see Buffalo, um, you see, you know, this, this bear represented down there in, in this darkness that needs the light to be brought to it. Um, it just encapsulates that mindset of all of these theoretical things that um, we've been talking about up to this point. Um, but even before this idea of this westward progress, as early as the colonial era, newspapers um, were portraying American Indians as savages, um, you know, danger to women, children, you know, honestly, anyone and everyone. Um, or you had this idea also early on in the founding of um, the United States of this noble savage. And I love this image because the man in this image is literally positioned like the thinker. Um, how interesting. So there was sort of this ping pong between savage or um, noble savage who was in tune with nature and, you know, and much of that was dependent on how compliant Native nations were being with um, the newly formed American government's agenda of land acquisition, et cetera. Um, would, would be how those uh, portrayals would play out. Um, but what it also meant was um, supporting that progress is either turning a blind eye toward government's mistreatment of those native nations or a willingness to justify that mistreatment um, via an end justifies the means mindset. And both viewpoints were employed in the history of our nation's journalism often in tandem with major shifts in governmental Indian policy. Um, I'll stop, Oop, let me see if I can, my mouse is hiding from me. Um, I was gonna stop sharing just for a minute. And... I stopped your screen share. Okay, thanks. Let me, there, okay. Uh, there we all are. Um, so, in addition to broadening our definition of the fields of history and communication um, to include a more critical perspective, we also, I think, have to rethink how we approach and examine archival materials 
um, particularly when it comes to scholarship about indigenous peoples. Um, in both traditional history and media history, that means making room for research that speaks into silence, closely examining spaces where we do not readily um, or easily hear the voices or find the words of Native Americans. Um, and that is definitely true in media history. There is usually a little nod to the Native press via the founding of the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, for a recent project, though, I was just surveying um, the texts on my, my office bookshelf that are attempting to sort of do a broad history of American journalism. Only one out of 12 books offered more than one line about the native press, yet there are entire chapters on the black press, on the immigrant, immigrant press, on the suffrage press, et cetera. Um, so it's an important gap. Um, and that's where I'm really passionate about. So people are not hearing from the people we can't find, how do we know what they were saying? Um, archaeologist Anne Laura Stoller really advocates the necessity of reading along the archival grain um, as an avenue to understanding what the content, organization, and structure of an archive reveals about the dominantly represented groups that really created and uh, continue to maintain those archives. It's in the process of reading archives oppositionally, essentially exploring the margins and absences um, that we're able to find those two often overlooked voices. So an effective scholarly tool for analyzing the ways in which historic and journalistic texts reproduce some of those power-based inequalities um, is called critical media discourse. And essentially it, it's a big part of what I do, which is a really close reading analysis of those texts combined with an understanding of the frame of reference, the context in which those texts were produced. And that really allows us to assess the significance of particular ideas or meaning in historical documents um, or in the journalism of a given period. And it also offers insight um, into the ways problematic representations continue to manifest in the current moment. Um, so we talked about those misrepresentations often relying on stereotype. And it's a key component in what another media scholar, George Gerbner, um, calls symbolic annihilation. And it's a process that relies on stereotyping, misrepresentation, and in some cases, underrepresentation um, to maintain the status quo uh, by failing to give authentic voice to marginalized groups. Another scholar, Tuckman, saw that working through um, omission, which means there, is, there just is no representation. We're not finding it in the media. Um, trivialization. So think about the stereotypical cartoon Indian um, and things along that vein. Um, and lastly, through condemnation. So um, narratives, again, that show American Indians as savage, um, as stubborn, as non-compliant, you know, as a problem. Um, all of those means have been used sometimes subconsciously, uh, other times with determined deliberation to silence native voices um, in the telling of United States history and in news coverage of American Indian issues and identity. Journalism historian, John Coward, and now I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen um, so that you all can see. Let me jump ahead. Um, there's John. Um, I consider him a friend and colleague. Um, he talks about, in a seminal work on representations of Native Americans in the 19th century press, um, that even in moments when the tone of news coverage wasn't negative, it still fell short. And you can see the quote there, 19th century journalists could be sympathetic to Indians from time to time, but they could not render Native Americans as fully realized individuals from cultures as valuable and important as their own. And he goes on to note in his work that even in moments when native leaders or citizens are heard from in their own words, 
they didn't have control over the presentation or the editing of those words. Um, so a big transition in the 19th century, the early 19th century, so we've moved from the colonial era press um, to this idea of the need for westward expansion. Um, the Civil War, War was a very disruptive moment um, for native, the native press. Um, it was a time of very real growth for um, the rest of American journalism. But when that war ended, there was a huge push to again continue westward expansion um, as quickly as possible. And that's when we start to see that era that in um, popular history um, used to be referred to as the Indian Wars. Um, and the images you see on your screen are just some of the big stories of that larger narrative. Um, you know, um, when Custer was killed, the coverage of that was of course sympathetic to him and it was um, an outrage. Um, and you see one of the more famous images um, from Wounded Knee um, and the massacre there. And what is happening in this moment is this push, not only westward, but the constant relocation of these nations from um, who had already been relocated forcibly, oftentimes at least once or twice. And so there are ads running in newspapers and literally saying Indian land for sale, um, fine grazing, great for agriculture, but not at all offering the context of why these conflicts are happening from a native perspective in any way. Um, we also see the rise of what are called dime novels toward the end of the century and carrying into the early 20th century. Um, you know, the, the Kit Carson type Indian fighter uh, story and narrative takes hold. Um, you see one of the headlines from when Sitting Bull was killed. Um, and a lot of people don't know that um, L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz, which is how most of us know him, was a newspaper editor in the Dakotas during this era. And um, following the murder of Sitting Bull, um, he wrote a couple of editorials essentially advocating genocide. And his argument was, there's been so much harm for so long that we will never be able to live without fear. And his wording is essentially, so we should just go ahead and finish the job. Um, that usually shocks my students when they hear that because they don't understand that there was a moment in our history and our news media was a big part of that in the moment in, in this debate of assimilation versus annihilation. Um, and it was parlor talk to, share your viewpoint on the, um, quote, Indian problem, end quote. Um, so the Dawes Act at the end of the 19th century with allotment was huge. Um, the article you see on screen here, records keeper sends them away without feathers, is just one of the first examples I want to share with you about how these old narratives that were created by these long gone editors continue to manifest. So this particular article is the legacy of the Dawes Act, but it doesn't actually acknowledge or understand the significance of that. So it says, um, suddenly it's become fashionable to be an Indian. And Kent Carter has to resist countless emotional demands. In his words, he sends most people away, quote, without a feather in their cap. So he's an archivist at the Federal Archives and Records Center. Um, and people are coming there trying to verify heritage to get land. Um, and then he's quoted again and says, lots of people left the reservation and moved out of Oklahoma, like to Texas, and they were afraid um, they'd be sent back forcibly, so they listed themselves as white. But for those still determined to prove Indian heritage, 
he sends them to the so-called Dawes Rolls. Um, and there's a very brief explanation of what that supposedly means. But for anybody who is Native American, there is so much history around that, that land loss and that you know, forced assimilation mindset that we, we know that people did leave and were afraid of their identity and what it might mean and the implications. And it just speaks to not understanding the context in order to tell that story effectively and well. And so at its most basic level, it's a problem of sourcing. Journalists are trained to seek out the best source uh, for the information that's needed to tell both sides of a story um, or to represent both sides of an issue. But typically when it comes to stories about native issues and individuals, journalists end up talking about native people when they should be in conversation with them. And too often the conventions of a given field mean once again, native voices are silenced. Um, there are those simple and effective ways that we can move toward a more authentic representation of American Indians in our history and our journalism. So in our historical scholarship, we need to take a more interdisciplinary approach in our examination of native issues, individuals and identity. And I can stop sharing for a moment if you'd like um, until it's time for those resources. Um, that requires us to be open to including non-traditional source materials, um, including but not limited to um, tribal archives and oral histories. Um, as historian Philip J. Deloria explains, Indian history, as it is and has been preserved, narrated, and owned by Native people, is absolutely central to any thinking about American Indian pasts. So it's really a call to seek out and cite the research and writings of Indigenous scholars. And lastly, we shouldn't leave history in the past. The problematic representations that are found in the historical press continue to manifest today, and we absolutely have to connect the past with the present if we hope to offer more um, authentic and thorough representations in the current moment. Um, so if we as historians do research about or as journalists report on Native people but fail to be in dialogue with Native scholars and sources, um, we're complicit in sustaining the systemic processes that have silenced Native voices. Overlooking or failing to offer the Native perspective perpetuates power as a weapon um, in the production of any history or practice, and that includes journalism. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that issues of American identity are complex, maybe sometimes controversial. Um, Lakota scholar Hillary Weaver says it's because there's little agreement on precisely what constitutes an indigenous identity, how to measure it, and who truly has it. Um, that's further complicated by a lack of consensus on correct terminology. Um, the issues of determination and labeling are problematic within individual tribal communities, as well as within the broader native community. So it's perhaps understandable that non-native scholars and journalists struggle in that regard. Um, it's more difficult to understand why they repeatedly fail to reach out to sources that can point them in the right direction. And one of the easiest sources for that information is the Native American Journalists Association, NAJA. Um, a quick trip to their website offers multiple resources to assist both Native and non-Native journalists with their coverage of newsworthy issues affecting Native communities. And I'll go back to sharing so you can see some of those resources. And let me play that and forward it. Oh, let me share these pictures too. I should have clicked through when I was talking. As we were talking about that turn in the 20th century and shifts in coverage, um, following up on the first story, real Indians soon to call city home. This is a story about the urban relocation effort. Cleveland is going to get some new Indians, but this is no baseball story. Honest Injun, the real Indians. If you continue to scroll through that text, you see first to arrive before another moon goes by, an 18-year-old maiden, first smoke signals, 
um, they're in a powwow, the great white father. Um, those are terminologies carried over from the 19th century press. Um, you can see this image of MacArthur with quote, his Indian warriors. Um, again, his, um, not so much recognizing them as individuals and the choices they made to serve in that global conflict. And then another image, um, perhaps some of you have come across from the occupation um, at Alcatraz, um, a moment in um, the native press where you have the, the red power movement, the red power press happening, um, talking back to some of these representation issues that we are talking about. Um, so nausea, one of my favorite resources that they have out there is their bingo reporting in Indian country edition. And basically their point is, if you look at some of the terminologies on this bingo board, if you're able to make bingo after reviewing your copy, you need to start again because you're incorporating too many stereotyped ideas um, and terminologies. So that's great. They also offer um, other resources to help. You know, we talk about this idea of labeling being problematic. They have very clear direction um, on when and how to use certain terms. And of course, being tribally specific when that is an option um, is, is the best. Um, so um, indigenous journalist Jenny Mott points out that often when a specific nation is named, it's because it carries a sense of familiarity for the intended audience. Um, people maybe are familiar with Navajo, maybe they're familiar with Cherokee. And so journalists might avoid using a tribally specific name if they feel like their readers or audience won't be as familiar with it. Um, she says it's not a mistake. Those tribes are among the most popular in the mainstream media because the mainstream media go toward the familiar. Um, so too often stories about native communities and individuals that capture the attention of major national news outlets aren't news to the communities and individuals that are affected, um, meaning those issues and challenges have been ongoing for years, if not generations. So when a native centric story makes national headlines, it's typically because it's part of a larger non-native narrative um, that often perpetuates those stereotypes, furthers um, coverage gaps and solidifies existing distrust that Native communities have toward outsiders covering them. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline coverage is a great example of that. So here is one image from that moment in time, and here's another. And I ask my students so often to compare these images and ask them to think about which one do they think came from a Native media outlet and which one didn't. Um, and scholars who've examined coverage of the Dakota Access Pipeline essentially say non-Native outlets really tie up the conflict between protesters and opposition outlets talked about the water protectors and the proactive reasons that people were showing up in this moment um, and, and attempting to make their voices heard. Um, another example of this, and I'm trying to wrap up as quickly as I can so we have time for questions. Um, and this example is really particularly salient in the current moment. Um, so the idea of framing stories negative versus positive and highlighting oppositional elements also plays out um, in stories around the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, so this is a case um, from 2016 involving a girl who was then a, a six-year-old Choctaw girl, and she had been placed with a white foster family. The story made national news. Um, there was a stark contrast in the coverage based on who was telling that story. So KGO, which was an ABC affiliate in San Francisco, headlined its coverage on in Child Welfare Act separates foster daughter from Santa Clarita family. And this was from their website. It goes on to tell the readers um, in photos, they're a happy family, but Sunday could be the worst day for the lives of Rusty and Summer Page and their six-year-old foster daughter, Lexi. 
The story notes Lexi is 1.5% Choctaw, and because of that, her case fell under the Indian Child Welfare Act. Well, that same week in a news story dated March 22nd, Indians.com ran a story headlined, Anti-Indian Child Welfare Act Attorney Takes on Another Dispute. This article offers more detailed explanation of the facts of the case, explaining this case has been ongoing for at least two years, that the Foster family knew for some time that Alexandria P., the child they called Lexi, fell under the guidelines of ICWA, and her father had been pursuing his parental rights for several years leading up to, quote, Lexi's removal from the Page home. And before the passage of ICWA, generations of Native children had been taken from their communities, first by missionaries and government officials, and later by social workers and representatives of a government that believed assimilation into a dominant society through adoption and foster care or education in off-reservation boarding schools was in the long-term best interest of those children. Those policies of placing Indian children in non-Indian homes and families served to perpetuate the assimilationist policies of the 19th and 20th centuries, which resulted in a, quote, de facto ethnocide of values, attitudes, and customs, um, end quote, as Native children were forced to substitute Euro-American values, language, and dress for their traditional ones. Um, anthropologist, again, Pauline Turner Strong, in drawing a comparison between modern day legal cases challenging ICWA and colonial era captivity narratives that were popular in early American books and newspapers, once again points to the idea of connecting the past with the present in any coverage of native issues. Noting that prob problematic coverage results when non-native media outlets fail to understand and appreciate the strength of those historical memories. And I can stop screen sharing at any point. Um, so the need to provide that critical historical context is an important way, um, is an important way that news media could include the native perspective in coverage of issues affecting native communities. Finding the right sourcing, um, seeking out native scholars, artists, and professionals um, hiring more Native journalists in newsrooms everywhere, supporting Native news outlets. All of these are ways that we can actively in this moment um, improve and move away from those problematic past misrepresentations um, and maybe one day leave that legacy behind. Um, and I will wrap there so we have time for questions and I'm happy to entertain any of those. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenblatt. That that was spectacular. I I, I know myself and our other staff were furiously taking notes and uh, thinking about the connections between the field of journalism and the field of uh, anthropology, right? Which um, uh, the, our our discipline of anthropology and archaeology is we believe being called to a much greater accountability for the colonialist um, roots of the discipline and the harms, right, that, that were caused uh, by the discipline. And it sounds as though um, journalism may be, may be going through a, a similar kind of shift. Is that your I, experience? I hope so. I hope so. Um, you know, as with any discipline, there is a little bit of an old school thought on what history is. And that's my whole thing with, if we're not talking about how that legacy is happening now, just talking about the past, what are we accomplishing? You know, right. so absolutely. Now, I was really struck by uh, the, the facts and images that you said shocks your students, right? When, uh, when they hear it. And I think for, um, that really resonates with us as we try to build a, a cultural competency among non-native people um, that, that that true and authentic historic context, which is um, appalling, right? I mean, be, beyond, um, uh, beyond comprehension, the level of deliberate 
uh, symbolic annihilation and actual physical annihilation and, and uh, um, views towards genocide being an acceptable response, um, that, that shock, uh, I, I think, is really necessary, but also paired with the, the fact that uh, indigenous cultures and communities still have vital cultures uh, today and have gone through cultural revitalizations and indigenous language um, uh, uh, commitments, it, even in, in the face of all of that is, is something that we, we try to communicate as well. Um, uh, yeah, that, that room for reclamation, absolutely. Yeah, reclaiming what was lost, right. so important. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over for a second for a question from our Indigenous intern, uh, Emery. Um, Emery, would you would you like to unmute and un and show video for your question? Absolutely. Uh, I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it, but that's okay. Ah, thank you. Uh, so. Uh, I specifically just kind of had a quick question regarding reading the ad about like his, in, or not the ad, sorry, the story about his Indian warriors, um, as well as, I, I'm sure you've seen it about like kind of those old ads from the 1960s and 70s of like Indian child for sale, and now kind of the coverage of cases involving ICWA, where it's like, they're stealing her, like their daughter, rather yeah. than like, no, this is a child who fell under ICWA. So I guess I was just kind of wondering, like, do you think the coverage of cases like Lex Lexi or Alexandria uh, kind of call back to cases like the Indian children for sale or like his Indian warriors at all? I do. It's, um, you know, the very rich body of scholarship, um, you know, around this concept of of the vanishing Indian and um, the idea that they needed to vanish Native Americans in order to move forward with the fruition of American progress as it was defined via Manifest Destiny. Um, and so one idea of that was the assimilation. The other is this extreme of just elimination. You know, if they won't comply, then we've, we, you know, we have to move forward. And, and then there was a huge, um, Part of the missionary press also were organizations that were um, supportive, trying to be, quote, helpful to the American Indians. But again, they supported assimilationist policies. And so it's that mindset of, well, these children are in a better place. Therefore, why are we rocking the boat? Why would, why would we want to send a child back to what we assume to be this dismal poverty, et cetera, which speaks to the issues around that nausea bingo card. It's all of these assumptions about what it means to live an, on a, an authentic American Indian life that are erroneous in many cases. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go to, uh, unless you wanna pick one, Emery, I'm gonna go to, um... Kind of this overarching uh, audience question that I think uh, a lot of us would be interested in, in terms of going forward. Um, uh, the question is, do you find that there is now some active and successful penetration of the hegemonic information structure? Where are we in this process in, in 2022? Oh, that, that's, well, that's a long conversation. Um, <laughs> if you're speaking in, in not just representation around American Indian identity, um, you know, I'm saying buckle up for the midterm elections because this discourse around the division in our nation is going to ramp up. And I think maybe in ways we haven't even seen yet. And we've seen a lot. Um, when it comes to representation around American Indian identity and issues, um, I think this is going to be very interesting because we now have Native Americans in some high ranking positions in this administration that brings some positive profile. Um, it also does maybe bring a little more profile to some of these issues we've touched on today. But I think it will also, because of this division, bring some pushback in ways that people maybe haven't thought about. The um, story around these 
assimilationist residential boarding schools is a huge story in Indian country. It has reopened old wounds. It's created new ones generationally. And I was in conversation with Levi Rickard, who runs Native News Online. And he said, we are, our coverage plans are three to five years out. That's how big this story is. But I think we're going to see some pushback for people who don't want that reckoning. They just want to say, that's unfortunate, but we all have to move forward. Well, that's a narrative we've heard before. So. Emily's going to ask a question. All right. Uh, so we got, speaking of recent journalism around Native American affairs, have you by any chance examined the language or reporting about the recent Supreme Court decision about Eastern Oklahoma reservation legal jurisdictions, including the opinion written by Justice Kavanaugh? And oh, as a yeah. Cherokee person, I would love to hear your perspective on how it's been reporting. Right. Well, and I will tell you, so I am not a legal expert. It has been fascinating. Um, again, if you're looking at coverage outside of Indian country and native media, there you do often see not enough context for people to understand why this is such a big issue. Um, one of the people I have loved um, having conversation with and hearing thoughts around is uh, Rebecca Nagel, who does This Land podcast. Um, she is all in on this McGirt coverage. Um, and again, what we see historically, even though those journalists in that moment might not have thought of it this way, are attacks on sovereignty, right? The, the ability to, to keep our children, the ability to determine our laws, um, to be self-governing, are all there in these treaties and treaties were broken for so long that I do think a lot of people struggle to understand why this pushback in this moment. And I think a lot of people honestly were surprised when the story broke and went beyond Indian country um, to understand that there are self-governing sovereign nations um, within the boundaries of what they call the United States. Seems like an, an interesting, um... Uh, disproportionate reach in in journalists that so many Americans, uh, non-Native Americans, uh, don't have uh, a concept or a competency around around those issues, which kind of uh, leads me to a, a question: When you you said uh, about journalists and, and the field that you don't uh, that it's hard to understand why they fail to reach out to Native sources when there are um, these resources, which um, the, the Native American Journalists Association, I believe we will all be researching that material, that, that whole lot there. And I, there were a couple um, potential reasons that uh, occurred to me that I was wondering if you might comment on because they're very similar to why wouldn't archeologists reach out to native sources when um, doing research on the past of ancestral people. And one of them, uh, uh, that I was wondering is potentially a fear of being criticized by native people and a lack of, of a cultural competency um, and a personal competency to be able to engage in those conversations. Um, uh, uh, or do you see or experience that it may be that, that they don't, uh, maybe those practitioners don't actually value native voices um, for uh, whatever reason and or that the pro profession doesn't still doesn't really value, authentically value uh, Native voices in to the extent that maybe it could be career harming for journalists who took that, that, that route to try to gather that information. Sure, I think it's a couple of things. I think um, in the field of history, traditionally, um, organic sources are, were not considered credible, right? It's What's in the documents? Go to the documents. If it's not in the documents, then it's not there. And that's when I say there is as much history in those silences, right? Um, and when it comes to journalism, I have no doubt there's probably a bit of a, a fear factor, an intimidation factor of getting it wrong. Um, better to avoid and go to, you know, because it's easy for us as journalists to say, I spoke to 
you know, bureaucrat X at department Y, and here's what they said, quote. And that's true and factual, but it doesn't mean it's the whole story. Um, and there are moments, and, and for those of us um, here who um, come from Native communities, we know that politics can be complicated. Politics of identity can be complicated. So I think there's fear of, well, I talked to this source, but then someone else told me that source isn't the right source. And so then it's just, I'm going to back off and not do any of that. Um, but again, that's where it requires. And that's where if you talk to anybody um, who's worked in Native media or who is from a Native community, they say, don't show up and expect us to talk to you when things are going wrong, which is the only time you come. Show up at a basketball game. Build relationships ahead of time. And especially if you're working at a media outlet that is in Indian country or near the sovereign land of a tribe, you should, those, those relationships should be a normal part of your rounds as a journalist. So. Right. And we can hope that uh, some encouragement and tools uh, to do that will prevail. Uh, I wanted to ask a, a question that was sort of specific, but I think has, uh, I'm curious about generally, uh, someone had referenced um, the, the, the Pope's apology uh, recently, and, and did you have anything to say about that? And I and some of our professional associations are also issuing formal apologies to indigenous people. And I was uh, wondering, um, what's your sense of the, the utility, the value uh, of such uh, apologies from uh, entities that clearly wronged indigenous people in the past and present. Absolutely, yeah. And I will, I will be honest and first to say, I'm still processing a little bit. I, <laughs> I have a, um, a file that I shove things into that I want to go back to, and that file is exploding right now. Um, I think it's a positive that there is this reconciliation movement tour events happening. I think. Having that conversation is important. Um, I did know, you know, as I was watching just network news, right? It's kind of like, oh, the Pope's in Canada. He apologized, met. Things looked pretty good. If you go to some of the native media outlets, they are like, what's up with giving him a full headdress? Like that is one of the highest honors. Do we need to go that far? in making this better. And so that goes back to, right, these journalists who are probably like, who's right, you know? And so they just don't talk about it in non-native media, whereas native media is, is all over this. And I think, um, one, it's going to be a huge story. It's an important story. I think you're going to see differences of opinion, and I think that's okay. And that's another really important point about um, coverage of native issues. Um, there, there has been historically this tendency to assume that all Indians think alike on all things. We are individuals and have different opinions based on our experience, our nation's experience, and interactions with the United States government. So I think we're going to have to allow room for different nations to respond differently. Um, but I do hope the leaders of those nations will do that in concert and conversation with their people. And thank you. And we're right at five o'clock and I think that's a that's a great uh, message uh, to end on. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Greenblatt. You all. This, uh, this has been spectacular and we will be um, uh, tempting you hopefully on your on your next trip to the Southwest uh, to come to Crow Canyon and uh, have some some conversations with with our staff and partners too. Yes, I would love that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you and we hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful evening. All right, take care. <laughs>